Hi, I'm Zoe Boyd, and today we are behind the screens with actor Glenn Morshower. Hi, Zoe. Thanks for having me. So, how old were you when you knew that you wanted to be an actor? I was the same age you are, Zoe. I was 11 years old, and that moment in my life took place in the same city we're in right now, Dallas, Texas. Uh, my mother had taken me to see a production of a play called A Christmas Carol, written by Charles Dickens, and what I didn't know when the curtain came up was that a dear friend of mine was in the play. So I was surprised and she looked like she was having so much fun that at intermission, and I had this little Northeast Texas accent like this, I said, Mom, what could I do to be in those plays? Could I study or whatever? And she enrolled me in, in uh, theater classes a week later and it changed my life. What do you enjoy most about your hometown, Dallas? You know, people are wonderful here. They're as genuine as the day is long and they, they, they talk a little different. Some of them sound like this. Some of them even look like this, <laughs> which is kind of a, a, a different experience. <laughs> I like the friendliness of the people here. You know, there's an old saying that there are only two kinds of people in the world, Texans and those who wish they were. Uh, there's a lot of truth to that because there's an inherent warmth with being a native Texan and I enjoy genuine people. Not that there aren't genuine people everywhere. There are. I mean, we love we love the people, the friends we have in in California. But there's there's just something real nice about being down home. You know, someone offers to change your tire. It's not because they want something. It's because they just want to give you a hand. They want to be nice. They're not looking for anything in return. So I know that you originally wanted to pursue a theater, but that's not what fate had in store for you. Is there a part of you that wishes you could still do theater or something on Broadway? Well, see, that's the beauty of the life of an actor is just because you've chosen a particular aspect of it, which for me is the film and television world, doesn't preclude me doing theater. I can do theater anytime I want. I just put the other on hold, and one of the uh, pieces of business that's on my life bucket list is to play on Broadway and I've turned down Broadway twice, I will not turn it down a third time. So I'm excited about the possibility of playing on Broadway at some point because I love a live audience and I travel extensively doing a, a motivational speaking program that uh, involves me having a live audience right there. And that's, that's a chance to get on the boards and work out those old chops of, of being an actor on, in a theater. So I hear you're also a motivational speaker in your program, The Extra Mile. What inspired you to do that? The fact that I love people and I really, you know, on the day that I die, I want to be caught helping someone. That means the world to me. I think it's the primary reason for which we were created, to be people of service. And this is a program that started out once upon a time, The Extra Mile started out as a program of empowerment to help actors, to help them get better at the art of auditioning. And I taught it for many years in Los Angeles. And then about 10 years ago, this good old boy comes up to me in Houston and he goes, hey, Glenn, and he pronounced my name in two syllables, kind of the way I was raised to, to hear it. He didn't say Glenn, he said Glenn. He goes, you know, my granddaughter told me if you were in, ever in Houston, I was supposed to come hear you speak and you can see that I've done that. And um, son, you weren't up there talking about acting as much as you were talking about life. And I'm wondering if you might want to come talk to my people at Exxon. The man changed my life on a dime. Gave me his card and I realized that apparently there was a universality to the message that I bring that, um, that would play well anywhere. So I started talking at the corporate level and now my only requirement for an audience member, Zoe, is that they have a pulse. If someone has a pulse and they're alive, they're my people. What film are you most proud of and why? Really, there are several projects, but if I had to select one, it would be, I have to select two, actually. It would be either Black Hawk Down, which we did in 2001, or a wonderful movie called 84 Charlie Mopig, shot in 1988. Uh, both films are war films. Uh, one story took place in Vietnam, that was 84 Charlie Mopig, and then of course Black Hawk Down, took place in Mogadishu. We didn't film in Mogadishu. Uh, both were based on true stories, real events that happened. We filmed Black Hawk Down in uh, uh, Morocco because it's far more film friendly than Mogadishu in Somalia. And we had a tremendous time. And of course, the man that I play in the film 
Uh, his name is Colonel Tom Matthews. I had the privilege of having Colonel Tom actually be there on set as our tech advisor. So imagine the, the experience of being as far away as I am from you, from the very man who I'm portraying in the film. He's the ultimate critic because I'm essentially being him in front of him. So at the end of a take, I would look over and just please send me one of these. You know, if you give me the thumbs up, that's the only review I really care about. It was a life-changing experience and I'm honored to have been a part of it. Directed by the great Ridley Scott. So I read somewhere that comedy, oddly enough, is your background. I would have never suspected that of you. Well, here's the deal, Zoe. I happen to believe that every moment in life should be very, very serious. There's no reason to ever be playful. Y mucha gracia para escuchando este radio estación en Guisteria. Y mucha gracia. Y ayer en la noticia día, Trinidad. And the big Mississippi in the town Honolulu in the Lake Titicaca. The Pope of is not in Canada, but rather Mexico, Mexico, Mexico. Canada Molecule Remedy Brendacy, Canada Molecule Remedy Brendacy, Canada Molecule Remedy Brendacy, Canada Molecule Remedy Brendacy. Yes, yes. Tibet, Tibet, Tibet. Nagasaki, Yokohama. Nagasaki, Yokohama. Three, four. What to do to die today at a minute or two till two? A thing distinctly hard to say, but harder still to do. The beta to do at twenty to do with the rat a tata to tata to two, and the dragon will come when he hears the drum at a minute or two till two today at a minute or two till two. Biba, biba, ti. Biba, 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 aluminum linoleum, aluminum linoleum, aluminum linoleum, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, toy boat, red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather, red leather, yellow leather, cinnamon, 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 unique New York, unique New York, unique New York, unique New York, woo war, 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 woo, wow. Now, what were you saying about comedy? So your last name is originally spelled with a C instead of an S. Why is it that you changed the spelling? I will explain that for you. Picture the name Morshower, but picture it the way it's spelled legally, M-O-R-C-H-O-W-E-R. -E if you looked at that and you didn't know me, how would you pronounce that? And that's what everyone did. And I got tired of hearing our name mispronounced, so I changed the C to an S. And from that point on, which was when I was 16 years old, people read the credits and they then said, more shower. And that's all I wanted was for them to say our family name correctly. Nothing more. So in 2001, you survived a car accident. What was that like? On December 5th of 2001, my son and I, Greg, who at that time was 21 years old, were in a really bad car accident in the Siskiyou Mountains of Southern Oregon. Uh, it was the middle of winter and we got into a bad snowstorm and the roads were really icy and I lost control of the vehicle and we went barreling down a mountain road and I hit a parked 18-wheeler doing 53 miles per hour. I looked at the speedometer as it was climbing right before impact, I took one last look and saw that we were doing 53. Um, and to go to 53 to zero is pretty brutal on a human body. So both of us were beaten up pretty badly, but no broken bones, um, a lot of blood, and we lived through it. We got out of the car only to watch within 45 seconds another 18-wheeler have the exact same thing happen to him, and he came barreling down the hill and plowed right up our backside and we watched what would have been our deaths if we had stayed in the car. So the lesson here, Zoe, is that in life, when you get a gentle whisper, follow it. And that whisper said, get out of the car. And that's the only reason I'm even speaking with you today is because we obeyed that whisper and we lived. I'm sure being an actor, you've been able to travel the world. What is your favorite place that you've gotten to visit? Without a doubt, Vancouver, British Columbia arguably the prettiest place on the planet. Uh, I've also grown very fond over time of Zion Canyon National Park in southern Utah, but I've never filmed there. Uh, we have filmed in Vancouver numerous times. And I've also been blessed to film in London. Uh, that was awesome. We did X-Men First Class in London, and now the Series 24 is getting ready to head over to London to do 12 more episodes. Do you have any words of wisdom that you live by? I do indeed. Listen to the whisper within you. To pay attention to those voices within, they are directives, they are there for our 
guidance and for our protection. And we make a big mistake when we have to ask them to make sense or we ask that they be convenient. When we just trust, trusting is a huge part of life, Zoe. And as a performer, we, we have chosen an abstract career that can't really be explained well on paper, but it is something you do because of a deep-seated passion within you, and I encourage human beings to say yes to their passion. What's the most extreme thing that you've ever done to prepare for an audition? I have put baloney in my undershorts. I don't know if that qualifies as extreme, but yes, my dear, I have actually done that on more than one occasion. So casting directors tend to see you as a more law enforcement, military type. Why do you think that is? Probably because I was raised by a, um, a very stern authority figure. Uh, my stepfather was very much that way, a uh, strong disciplinarian. And that just seemed to make more sense because I had that deeply instilled in me. And for some reason, if you sound like this, they don't want to cast you as the person that's making major corporate decisions or something like that. Like, and I would look strange in a tutu. I would. It would be so ridiculous. But I have, I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you, Zoe. I have wanted to play a character like this, like works in a hair salon or a bakery or something. That would be so much fun for me. But yet, authority figures tend to be the direction that my life has gone. Did your parents support you as a kid about wanting to be an actor? They did. In fact, not only did they, but they had... They did. Uh, the truth is they gave me overwhelming support. And they did it immediately. I started training about a week after I saw the show, the play that I mentioned to you. And they stood by my side and then, you know, I hit that big moment where I looked them in the eye and said, I'm moving to Hollywood. And that's not something a lot of parents are quite ready to hear. I think what most parents hope is that you'll grow through it and out of it as though it's some sort of a disease and you'll overcome it. But here's the deal. If you really are innately a performer, you don't grow out of it. It doesn't leave you. It's not an affliction. It's a desire of your soul. And it ran that deep with me, so I really had no choice. I am a performer by design. So all I did was say yes to an existing gift that God gave me. What question would you like to be asked in an interview that no one ever asked you? What I stand for and what I believe in. We're here, Zoe, to love and help one another.